We welcome now uh, Rabbi Ellie Spitz to teach us for the next 30 minutes or so. Um, Rabbi Spitz has served Congregation B'nai Israel in Tustin, California since 1988. Uh, he was an adjunct, adjunct lecturer of Jewish law and pastoral rabbinics at the American Jewish University uh, for about 20 years from 1999 to 2008. So welcome Rabbi Spitz, thank you for being with us. Thank you. It's a joy for me to be part of this preparation for Matan Torah, for the receiving of Torah and Shavuot. We've been counting the Omer, we've been getting ready, and now it's only hours away, whether you're on the East Coast, or in my case, in Orange County, California. With the start of COVID and uh, sequestration, I began to use Zoom to teach Psalms. And in the course of these last 15 months, have developed far more appreciation for the artistry of the Psalms and their relevance in our own lives. And what I look to do with you now is share what I'm up to. I'm up to Psalm 132. And if you want to listen to a half hour presentation and some discussion on Psalms 1 to 131, my synagogue website, cbi18.org, has the archive. And that, again, has been the advantage of Zoom. Not unlike this moment, what we do is both shared and recorded. And so Psalm 132, coincidentally, but there are no coincidences, is a psalm that is distinctive in that it is the only psalm that makes reference to the ark. So why is that so significant on this, the hours before Shavuot? Because on Shavuot, our collective identity is not just being in our respective homes on Zoom, our collective identity is standing together as a community at the base of Mount Sinai. And there, tomorrow morning on Shavuot, a unique moment in religious history as defined by our community, namely that God addressed the entire people, not just the leader, which is normatively the case even in our tradition, not Moses or in other traditions, that supreme teacher. But the entire people heard God's voice. And you can imagine how difficult it was after that epiphany, after that closeness with God, for the people to leave Mount Sinai when the time came to depart. And so the last part of the book of Exodus of Shemot is a description of the development, the building of the Mishkan, the tabernacle, which is a portable Mount Sinai, just like Mount Sinai had three concentric circles, the people at the base, the leaders going to the beginning of the mountain, but only Moses going up to the top. So the Holy of Holies is only for the high priest on Yom Kippur. Only the priests enter into the tabernacle, and the people are around it in the courtyard. But at the center of the center, at the center of that Holy of Holies, is Aron HaKodesh, the Holy Ark. For it contains the souvenir of Mount Sinai. That is the physical reminder of that moment. So that ark, that Aron, will be used as the people leave Mount Sinai, heading to the Promised Land, and later in Jerusalem when the temple is built by Solomon. It will be the temple finally inaugurated when the ark comes to rest. Those are images of Psalm 132. Psalm 132, which I will read in a moment, but first a little bit of a backstory because Psalm 132 will describe the ark being brought to Jerusalem. 
will describe God's longing for a home. And that home was one that David does not build, although this is a psalm identified with David. And so here's the backstory. The second book of Samuel, chapter 7. Here's the opening. When he was settled in his palace, that's David, and the Lord had granted him safety from all the enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, quote, Here I am dwelling in a house of cedar, while the ark of the Lord abides in a tent. Unquote. Nathan said to the king, Go and do whatever you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But the next verse, verse 4 says, That night Nathan had a dream in which God appeared to him. And here's the outcome of that epiphany for him. Words to share with David. And so Nathan, verse 17, will say to him, He will say to him, not before verse 17, he will say to him, verse 12, When your days are done and you lie with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, one of your own issue, and I will establish his kingship. So one theme that will be part of Psalm 132. David will have a kingship, and that kingship will be enduring, a familial privilege. But David... Your offspring shall build a house for my name, and I will establish his royal throne forever. So David, you're not going to build it. Your son will, Solomon. With that, I'm going to ask that this psalm be put up. Are you able to do that? Psalm 132. Great. I will let you know I've been tinkering with this psalm really till the last moment. I'll point out a change in that the translations that I have done for these psalms. Again, infomercial, cbi18.org, to look at my project of translating the psalms and doing two things. One is trying to understand the artistry. Hence, my translations tend to be much more literal and sometimes not as fluid as a more mm, accessible poetic translation. I try to maintain the ambiguity of the text. And the second thing that I look to do is return as a pulpit rabbi to asking, how is the psalm relevant? And so with that, I will begin to read. I entitled this psalm from three lines that we all know. For whenever we return the Torah to the Ark, we will be chanting, right before the Eitz Chaim, we chant verses 8 to 10. And we'll get there in a moment. The beginning. A Song of Ascents. Remember Adonai for David all his affliction when he swore to Adonai and vowed to the powerful one of Jacob. Quote, If I come unto the tent of my home, if I ascend upon the couch spread for me, if I give sleep to my eyes, to my eyelids slumber, until I find a place for Adonai dwellings for the powerful one of Jacob. Behold, we heard of it in Ephrat, founded in the field of Ya'ar. Quote, let us come to God's dwellings. Let us bow down at God's footstool. Arise, Adonai. Kuma Adonai limnuchatecha ata avaharonu zecha. Arise, Adonai, to your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness and your devotees sing joyfully. For the sake of David, your servant, do not turn away the face of your anointed one. Adonai has sworn to David a truth. God will not turn back from it. From the fruit of your belly, I will set up a throne for you. 
if your children keep my covenant, im, circle the word if, your children keep my covenant and my testimony. This I will teach them. Also their children forever shall sit on a throne of yours. For Adonai has chosen Zion, has desired it for a seat for God. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. Her sustenance blessed, I will bless her needy. I will sate with bread. And her priests I will clothe with deliverance, and her devotees will sing joyfully. They will sing joyfully. There I will gleam a radiance. Or, as I will correct it shortly, there I will blossom a radiance for David. I have set out a lamp for my anointed one. His enemies I will clothe in shame, and upon him will gleam his crown. So back to the beginning of the psalm, and now to talk a little bit about the artistry. If you can hold up the psalm, uh, please, from the beginning, for the next 10, 15 minutes, I'm going to, if you can put the psalm back up. From the beginning. Now, what I do when I teach my psalms, is begin over to describe the artistry of these poems. I have grown to fall in love with Psalms because only in the close study of Psalms do I gain the understanding of how purposefully they are woven. And what I love about Psalms is a quality of yearning, a quality of honest expression from a variety of poets. We don't know for any single psalm who wrote it specifically, although here, for instance, it's Adonai, remember Adonai for David, but we're describing the temple that's built after David. And so in sum, we don't know for our respective psalms when they were necessarily written and by whom. But what we do know is that these psalms are our people's playlist. Wherever Jews have lived in these thousands of years, it's the psalms that have been our source of both connection to the land, expressing emotions of a variety of kinds that we may have wanted to say for ourselves, as is the nature of a well-chosen song. And so a bit about the structure and the artistry. Verses, this psalm is composed of two parts. Verses 1 to 10 is a description of promises to God. And verses 11 to 18 are God's response, God's vows in exchange. There too, I pause to say that Psalms always has as the mindset that one is able to have a conversation with God. And we do so in the Psalms again from that place of great hope of God listening and the ability to be honest. The first part of the Psalm verses one to 10 is divided into two. So if you can scroll for me, <laughs> one to five, that is part one. Part one is David's pledge. Remember Adonai for David, all is affliction. What, what is the affliction being referred to? Commentators will vary. Some will say that when David spoke to Nathan and he said, how is it that I'm living in this beautiful wooden home and God lives in a tent? That David, as we'll see in verses 3 and 4, said, if I come into the tent of my home, if I ascend upon the couch spread for me, if I give sleep to my eyes, to my eyelids slumber, 
I will not do so. The word im is often translated, though it's literally if, as a vow, saying, I will not come into my tent of my home. I will not ascend upon the couch spread for me. And so the affliction can be self-affliction. That David said, as long as God is without a home, I can't be fully at home. I will engage in self-denial. Though interestingly, although Psalms looks to earlier texts for context, often there are things like in this moment that appear in the psalm that are not in the earlier description that I read in opening from the book of Samuel. This is not recorded as something David said or, or David did. And yet, what we have here in verses 1 to 5 is the echo of that line. That line from 1 Samuel 7, in which David said, Here I am dwelling in a house of cedar, while the ark of the Lord abides in a tent. There are, in psalms, often unusual words. Almost in every psalm, there is something that is, in some cases, used nowhere else, or a phrase used rarely that's evocative. So one example for the artistry. In verses 2 and verses 5, God will be referred to as La'avir Yaakov. I translate as the powerful one of Jacob. The Jewish Publication Society will translate it as the Mighty One. Robert Alter and Adin Steinsaltz will translate it as Champion of Jacob. It's a word that only appears once in the five books of Moses, specifically when Jacob is blessing Joseph. He will refer to God as Avir Yaakov, and it will occur three times in the book of Isaiah. Well, here's one reason that I'm proud to be a conservative Jew, and that's because of the Eitz Chaim, in that the Eitz Chaim has taught me that everything needs to be read like our commentaries with bifocals. What's the pshat, the contextual meaning, and what is the drash? What's the homiletical meaning? And here's another reason I always gain by having a copy with me of Cedar Sidur Lev Shalem. So some commentaries that come out of our two respective conservative texts. You got to keep up my um, back up my text. This is a partnership activity. And so this phrase, La'avir Yaakov, is referred to in our Eitz Chaim commentary as rooted in Akkadian, in which there was the phrase Bal Ibri, endowed with strength. Interesting, I didn't find that commentary elsewhere, except in our Eitz Chaim and that Pshat. And so Verses 1 to 5 have this little piece of a rare choice of words for God, La'avir Yaakov, that point toward God being the powerful one, the one who can affect change, with an echo, a ripple, from Jacob's blessing for Joseph, and perhaps those who were early in the land, and like Isaiah, influenced by a certain use of language that would become, in this psalm, emphasized as God's power. And now if you can scroll it to verses 6 to 10, I have one eye on the clock, knowing there is so much more to share. But this is the second half of the vow to God. Actually, if we had more time, you would see that this is a psalm composed of five quotes. The first quote that was part of 1 to 5 was David, and now in verse 7, 
it is as if it's the people saying, let us come to God's dwelling, let us bow down to God's footstool. And that God's footstool is another way of referring to God's ark. And with verses 8 to 10, those are the verses we now say when we stand in front of the ark. This is the third quote. And here we don't know who is saying these lines. Is it the whole people? Is it the leader saying it to the people? God is now di addressed directly. Arise, Adonai, Kuma Adonai to your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. And again, the Aron, refer referring to the holy ark, this is the only place in Psalms where that is done. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness and your devotees sing joyfully. For the sake of David, your servant, do not turn away the face of your anointed one. And so when we echo the words of Psalm 132, verses 8 to 10. Consider this the next time before you begin to sing the Eitz Chaim as the Torah has made the processional around the room, at least in pre-COVID times, hopefully someday soon, as people reach out to kiss the Torah. The Torah has made a journey, just like the image here is that the ark, which was taken captive by the Philistines for nine months, was then moved for 20 years and then would be brought to Jerusalem. And with verses 8 to 10, there is homecoming. The ark is being returned from captivity, from its journeys, from its travails. Sometimes, like when we take the Torah out of the ark, we chant also from the book of Samuel, Kuma Adonai V'yafutsu Ovecha, actually from Bamidbar, from Numbers. Arise, we say, Numbers 10.35, Vayihi bin Saron V'yomer, Moshe Kuma Adonai V'yafutsu Ovecha, all of your enemies will be scattered. The ark was the symbol of Mount Sinai, of Shavuot, the Ark with the Ten Commandments was the symbol of God's presence. The Ark with the Ten Commandments would go forward to lead the people to battle. But in this moment, in this psalm, in this echo, the Ark is evoked as homecoming, as peace, as security. And so as we stand in front of the Ark and we echo these words. We are to know that we're part of a people that goes back to the time of David longing for a sanctuary, of Solomon building a sanctuary with an ark that contains Ten Commandments of Shavuot, that when we open our ark are to see ourselves as completing a journey toward homecoming. And now verses 11 to 18. That's the second half of the psalm. Here, God's promise. And God says, Adonai has sworn to David a truth. God will not turn back from it. From the fruit of your belly, I will set up a throne for you. But there's a condition. Verse 12. Im yishmu banecha briti. Although there are statements in Tanakh, and a promise to David as that dream of Nathan to David that the kingdom will continue. Nonetheless, it's conditional. It's conditional on David's descendants, the kings that are yet to be, being those kings who are identified with following in David's way. Verse 15, 
For then God, because this is the reoccurring theme of Psalms, then God will provide sustenance for the needy. For God cares about those who are in need and saves them with bread. And her priests I will clothe with deliverance and her devotees will sing joyfully. And they will sing joyfully. This is a psalm that was read by Jews for 2,000 years in diaspora, not of the past, but of the future. That the song that was yet to be sung would be sung in Zion. That's verse 13. Scroll back. For Adonai has chosen Zion, has desired it for a seat for God. And again, with my eye on the clock and knowing that my time is now down to five minutes, we Jews, like this psalm, have yearned for Zion as God's chosen place. al Sheikh in the 16th century of Turkey, he would say in his commentary that the Kotel Hama'arvi, the Western Wall, maintains that sense of God's divine resonance. And wherever Jews were, we prayed toward Zion. The longing to go back Many said over those 2,000 years of diaspora was foolhardy to pray for. I mean, generation after generation, it hadn't happened. And yet, and yet, there was a miracle in 1948 with the recreation of a Jewish state and Zion. And so one closing thought. Now, sadly, as we share these words, there is fighting in the Holy Land. And sadly, there are those who say, peace, foolhardy, it'll never happen. The only way that we Jews return to Zion is because we longed for it and believed in it and repeated it psalm after psalm, Birkat Amazon and Amida daily prayer. But listen to the words of Isaiah chapter 2, in which he affirms that that house of the Lord will stand firmly. In days to come, the mount of the Lord's house shall stand firm above the mountains and tower above the hills, and all the nations shall gaze on it with joy. The two themes of Psalm 132, the mountain, the house, will endure and there will be rejoicing. And then Isaiah continues. And the many people shall go and say, quote, Come, let us go up to the mount of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may instruct us in his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For instruction shall come forth from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Thus he will judge among the nations and arbitrate for the many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not take up sword against nation. They shall never again know war. There is an intertwining link between the yearning for Zion and the yearning for peace. We are privileged to live in a generation in which we have begun to see the fulfillment of the promise of the return to Zion. Let us not lose our faith. Like the psalmist, let us yearn for peace. Psalm 132, much, much, much more to say about the artistry, the intricacy of the psalm's writing. But our challenge remains to make those words our own, and that is our privilege and to know that continuity with the past enables hope looking forward. Again, my infomercial, cbi18.org, that's my synagogue website, Congregation B'nai Israel, cbi18.org, for 131 psalms with my own translations. I have a wonderful national and even an international audience. I teach three days a week. Go to the website. Maybe you can join for the remaining eight, 17, 18 psalms. Thank you for allowing me to be a participant and a, a teacher. Chag Sameach.
Live with hope. Thank you so much, Rabbi Ellie Spitz, for taking us through the many layers of Psalm 132. You heard from Rabbi Spitz how you can um, explore some of the 131 previous Psalms. Uh, <laughs> thank you for, for leaving us with this message of hope as well. Uh, thanks, and, and great to be here with you. Thanks, thank you. Uh, we are going to uh, sw switch gears now and welcome Rabbi Bill Plevin to teach us for the next half hour. Again, we are at the Conservative Masorti Tikkun Leil Shavuot, still going strong all the way through noon tomorrow Eastern time. 